Let's do it. The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Hey guys. Yo, buddy. Hello, oh, man. I love uh, that you guys are rocking the sunglasses at 6 a.m. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <gosh. laughs> yeah, no, what time is it here? It's 6 p.m. Yeah, 6 p.m. here. 6 oh, 6 p.m. Oh, I thought you were 6 a.m. Oh, y'all are fine yeah. then. Imagine, no, you would not finish the party. <laughs> no, 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 you don't want to see us. I would be a hot mess. Well, regardless, uh, I, I rocking I the sunglasses at, at any time. Monero <laughs> price in a while. Looks like, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of green candles. Holy shit. Crazy stuff happening past week. I can't remember who it was, but someone pointed out that this was like more green candles than we've seen in a row than maybe it was like ever or only like once or twice in Monero's history. I didn't, uh, I was too really? lazy to go back and count, but yeah, I mean, this is a, I mean, it wasn't that epic in terms of like percentages. Okay. 25%, but just the fact that we had that many green candles in a row. I remember, um, yeah. a few weeks ago you were talking about, uh, that, Hey, if they delist Monero, like if our theories are right, that that should cause the price to go up. Right. Cause then they've got to acquire the Monero to pay the people out that, uh, you know, before they close the withdrawals. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe this is that, or maybe it's just Monero con. Yeah, and then we we also saw like a, a big increase in transaction count, right? Uh, we did. There was kind of a big spike. That probably was Monero count, uh, MoneroCon, uh, and also Porkfest. So Monero is in yellow here at the bottom. We spiked from like twenty thousand up to forty thousand. Uh, we're kind of back down to normal now. So this this would seem to make sense, maybe being Porkfest plus MoneroCon. Um, and or someone. I mean, when we see spikes like that, I always get suspicious that maybe. Um, maybe some entity is trying to track someone down, do some poison outputs, um, you know, trying to flood the network to maybe target like a few individuals. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not like, I wouldn't be able to say that I know the statistics well enough on that to, to see if like, to say that that might be reliable. We'd have to ask like one of the experts to really know that. Could it also be people like pulling their coins off of Binance or something? I haven't been following I suppose so. Yeah. I suppose so. There was, um, I don't remember which countries it was. It was like three or four EU countries. It's kind of weird. You'd think they would just pull them from all EU countries at the same time. Um, but right. I don't know. Maybe they need to slush some liquidity around still before they before they do that entirely. Yeah. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, then they, they re-added a bunch of other quote-unquote privacy <laughs> coins, but then they didn't really add Monero, right? Yeah, that was uh, that was special. So there was something like twelve coins that they delisted. I think it was eleven. You you really shouldn't include Beam because Beam was already delisted. We, I don't know why. I couldn't figure out. It was just like a very generic statement, like Binance reviews the quality and the community and the coin and some other things that sound really nice to regulators. And we determined that Beam could not continue to be listed. And it's like, okay, well, they didn't say exactly why. Uh, anyways, but yeah, they, they removed a bunch of coins. And um, and then they relisted most of them, except for, I think it was Mob, XMR, Firo, and maybe I think it was Beam. Um, so in my mind, the way that I kind of looked at that was, um, you know how when the mainstream media will come out and they will loudly proclaim the lie, they'll be like, this is the truth and look at this and oh my God, how terrible. And then like a few months later, they'll just quietly retract that and be like, oh yeah, we were wrong, right. but they won't, they won't do that. I think that's kind of what Binance here did with Monero. Um, again, you don't want to just be like, yeah, Monero is the only one that really, really meets those requirements. Um, I sat down for maybe like 30 minutes or an hour this week trying to um, do things like calculate volume, the Binance reported volume on these different coins to determine, uh, you know, and then also try and figure out uh, which of these coins are opt-in privacy versus default privacy. And I mean, guess what? They're all opt-in privacy, including Firo. I think Firo is trying to get away from that, but they're still technically opt-in. So anyways, the, mm -hmm. it's like they relisted a few coins. Um, the ones they relisted, I don't think they had much volume for. So it's like, okay, that's that's basically, you know, what the MSM does. They didn't want to single out Monero, so they removed all the privacy coins, and, like, and then they added, you know, a bunch of the other ones back. Um, and then, you know, obviously not Monero. So that was kind of my my crack theory on on what they were doing there yeah. in a social sense. Kind of bizarre. I also think maybe, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe like 
Zcash does better with communicating with exchanges and, and you know, maybe getting them to, to relist as opposed to Monero, right? There's, there's really nobody reaching out on Monero's behalf uh, to make arguments, right, as to why. But also Binance Monero's can just, like, use Zcash and shield it, right? Like, they choose not to shield any that they, they get and they send. Yeah, I mean, that's what they're going to do with these. So they relisted only opt-in privacy coins, and they're only going to not opt-in. I mean, Doug, if anything, we've got people from Monero asking CZ to please delist Monero. Like, please just end it, bro. Just just right. get rid of it. Right. It'll be ultimately better. Yeah, I think so. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean really... no complaints, right? Obviously, ultimately better in terms of not you know being part of the KYC machine, but also it doesn't seem to be having a negative effect on price, so. Yeah, it's like kind of a win -win. you know. Speak, speaking of KYC, um, the SEC called. So this was like yesterday. They called BlackRock and Fidelity ETFs inadequate. Um, so you know there was a bunch of uh, hype and and happiness about how uh, you know BlackRock and the and Fidelity and a, a whole bunch of other people too. I think like uh, Valkyrie, maybe Vanguard, uh, a few others. Anyways, um, they all tried to apply for ETFs, spot ETFs. So the more I looked into it. Yes, these are indeed spot ETFs where um, they will actually buy and sell the real asset, Bitcoin, um, to try and track the price and return the exact same as the underlying asset, um, that, that, which is what a spot ETF does. The ETFs that were released in 2021, they weren't actually tracking the price of Bitcoin. They were tracking the price of the futures market of Bitcoin on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the CME. So those are different things. Um, you know, they're not actually tracking the price, the underlying price of Bitcoin, sort of indirectly. Okay, but these recent ETF applications um, were uh, were for an actual spot ETF. But uh, the SEC yesterday said that they were inadequate for, get this, not specific enough about surveillance sharing between exchanges. Like that was the big thing mm. that they cited. So. I so guess, they're saying um, they're not enough tracking is, is taking place is what they're saying? They're, it's... Um, I think specifically their language was not enough uh, guarantees of tracking. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> like they, it's like they say, you know, maybe they're doing all the same tracking in the background, but they just didn't say, they didn't promise they were going to do enough. So That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. That, yeah, that's I, not, I thought that's Black not... was going to be the one to get, to get it through, right? Well, they, they might still. Um, I think, I don't know if it was Fidelity, at least a few of them have already resubmitted their application. So, I mean, I think they're mm -hmm. going to keep plugging away at this. They're going to keep trying. So, um, but yeah, that wasn't like, that wasn't the thing I was expecting the SEC to say as a rejection reason. I, I'm honestly, I'm not too surprised that they rejected it. I mean, I remember you asked me to give it some odds and I was like, well, I, I don't know, 50 50. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. But I think at some point, they probably will get approved. Um, it, 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 it's hard to say, right? Who knows? There's all kinds of politics happening in the background. Yeah. And so did that, like, once again, I haven't been keeping an eye, did that if, seem to affect uh, Bitcoin's price? Like the ne um, negative news? No. Like kind of sell the news? No, it, sell the no, Friday didn't seem to. I mean, there was kind of a big red candle down here. I, I don't know in terms of, now nah, in terms of timing, this red candle that happened, um, would not have been related to that news. Uh, I mean, that's only five five percent down. Uh, but yeah, Friday didn't really seem to overall see any any major downside to Bitcoin. So uh, I, I don't think that 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 news had a big effect. I mean, in a social sense, I think people like once you get bullish, uh, most people tend to start getting a bit irrational once you start getting more bullish. So I mean, the social sentiment at, at the moment I think is still is still pretty high. Right. Technically, we've made just a little bit. So these were our close prices on our. These were the close prices on on Bitcoin. The last sort of peak we had back in uh, in April. So the close prices have kind of peaked up above that a little bit. We've got some wicks up here. Price is still kind of struggling. Um, you'll notice that we have this line here at, at thirty two thousand. Um, I still think that it's very likely to to at least make a wick up into that line. Um, there, I mean, there is the case to be made that we could make it as high as 50,000, right? We, we could really actually try and run this. I think that there's there's other macro problems that are happening. And if if price is going to try and jump that high, it needs to happen soon. So for example, from, from the bottom, I guess from the very bottom, price is currently up by 100% on Bitcoin. So to get, to get there, we've got to go another 50% from where we already are. 
and uh, I, I'm I'm seeing things that just don't look congruent with um, with a mega pump. Um, we can start with the simple stuff like looking at the dollar, and we we talked about last week how price had kind of come down here, um, and that the dollar was, or at least the Dixie, the index of the dollar, which compares against um, the euro, Japanese yen, um, Canadian, Australian, and Swiss franc and Great British pound. Um, maybe the Swiss franc not, I might've added that on accident a anyways. Okay. So this is the Dixie that's, it, it compares against that basket of currencies, primarily against the euro, like 60% euro anyways. Um, so what we saw here was instead of coming all the way down, you know, to some of these more, uh, prominent lines, um, it just kind of stopped halfway and then decided to start coming up again. So we we're, we're running up into these resistances again, and it looks like, I mean, this is basically strength. Like, okay, the dollar didn't quite get into this zone right here. But essentially, this this looks like strength. The dollar is looking like it wants to make some kind of turnaround here. It doesn't have to do it immediately, like we talked about um, last week. It can it could sit here and kind of range for a little bit before actually breaking to the upside. But it does look like it's it's going to want to try and make another run to the upside. There's another thing that um, that's kind of important for us to look at, and that's the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Um, so basically, we're we're now actually. Uh, exactly at the same point that we were at the uh, at the lows in March, uh, right before the whole banking crisis started. So it, it's been interesting because you know the the bear market has been with these assets being sold off the Fed balance sheet, and then um, so that was from here to about here, and then the markets really started going up somewhere around this time, even though the Fed balance sheet was still going down. But ultimately this is kind of a liquidity thing and we're seeing dropping liquidity, right? There's less cash available in the market and this should probably continue going down because the federal reserve is probably going to continue selling that balance sheet. There was something that um, Monero Tony pointed out. Um, I think it was yesterday on Twitter and that was this concept called net liquidity. So essentially if you took the M2 SL for, uh, for basically all, I think it's the M2 SL. Let's go ahead and check that out just to make sure I have that right. Uh, well, no, I, sorry. It's just the balance sheet. Uh, if you look at the balance sheet of all the different, um, of all the different central banks. So like we're looking at China, Japan, UK, ECB, you know, all the big heavy hitter economies. So the net liquidity is in green. Uh, oh, that's the fed net liquidity. All right. Global net liquidity is in white. And what we've seen, let's go to the weekly. What we've seen is that broadly speaking, net liquidity for, uh, globe for both like the global net liquidity and the fed liquidity tends to correlate with big market pumps. And that makes sense. It means they're printing a bunch of money, right? Their balance sheet is expanding because there's new money being printed and that money is going to go somewhere. And typically it's going to go into risk assets. So we're looking at the S and P 500 here on the candles and effectively what we've seen as of late is that global net liquidity is dropping, even though uh, the stock market has kind of been going up or been, maybe you could say flat, but we've got this dropping global net liquidity. I don't know why on earth um, <laughs> the green line, the Fed net liquidity, this is someone else's script, by the way. So I just pulled this up. I only had time to pull up someone else's scripts. Usually I try and write my own. I need to figure out why the Fed's liquidity is like already projected into the future on, <laughs> on July here, July 17th. That's probably just an artifact of trading view, um, the way that the data is pulled. But anyways, the point is that we're seeing dropping global liquidity. We're seeing dropping liquidity in general, even though the stock market's kind of been going up, right? There's this divergence happening. So uh, again, we're we're kind of getting into this area where I, I look at these signals and I, I'm not comfortable saying that um, that things can continue going up for too much longer. And they probably can continue going up here a little bit more. Uh, we've got US 10 year here. Uh, the the ten year yield and this thing looks like it's it's flirting with trying to get up out of this uh, you know to break this this resistance to here uh, the downward sloping resistance so again that could still take some time we could see this thing trend this way um, maybe break here um, a lot of things that I'm looking at are starting to kind of look like August could could be the time to really start um, maybe taking some profits or starting to become concerned uh, obviously we've got to play it by ear. Overnight repurchase agreements. Probably this is what has been driving the stock market to stay high more than anything is uh, overall just the, the reverse repos have been coming down. That would be from 2.25 trillion all the way down to 1.29. So, um, you know, about $300 billion that probably could be going into the stock market. We don't know exactly where it's going, but with the stock market going up, that would be a, a good um, a good assumption. So, right, we've got the S&P here. It's actually made technically a slightly higher high. Um, you could probably try and say this this might look like the beginning of some kind of divergence, but 
I mean, who knows, right? This thing hypothetically could just keep on going. I think that this upsloping line here will probably act as a resistance. Um, maybe it's possible it could, you know, kind of end up doing that. Uh, again, at some point, I just, I, I, it's hard for me to expect that uh, that big new gains are coming for the stock market in the in the near term. Uh, this right here is the the Nasdaq divided by the S and P, so it's kind of like peaked out a little bit. Um, if you look at this, you could also say that uh, we're definitely looking at at divergence here, right? So we've got uh, the the momentum is going down, the Z scores are going down, even though a slightly higher high was made. So the idea with this chart is that usually when it's risk on, people go into the riskier assets, which would be the NASDAQ tech stocks. Um, so when usually in bull markets, you see the NASDAQ outperforming the S&P typically. And that's what we've basically had uh, since, since the beginning of this year. This is starting to look a bit toppy. Um, and then we've also got the NASDAQ here is, is still kind of struggling with this important resistance. Um, it looks like it maybe wants to try and break it, right? Like maybe we get above that. Um, so anyways, um, you know, happy gains, everyone. Uh, let's uh, let's take a look a little at Monero again, uh, a little bit more about the ratio. Um, actually, we'll do that in just a second. Okay, Bitcoin dominance. Uh, we peaked out at this 52, like this, uh, this kind of uh, white line that we had here, right? That's uh, kind of a, a reasonable spot to think might happen. So I, I do think it's possible that Bitcoin dominance has more to go. Um, especially like, okay, so maybe we could find some news events that could drive this. Maybe we see BlackRock resubmit their ETF, right? And then everyone can get really excited again that, oh, they're going to fix the surveillance problems. This will, of course, be great lulls for all of us Monero fans because it's like, oh, they're, they're going to promise to do more surveillance. So that's, that's really not what we're in it for, but okay, guys. Um, but on we go to Monero. So um, one thing I wanted to take a look, about, look at today with Monero was a few things that we don't normally look at. So I'm going to turn off all of these lines and stuff because that's really just that's one way to look at things. Um, I want to turn on some descriptive statistics. So the blue line here is the standard deviation um, of uh, basically the lifetime standard deviation of the entire chart. And uh, it, it includes it basically at every single point, every single candle. The standard deviation is recalculated for everything which came before it. So you know how usually you'll you'll have like a moving average. It's like, okay, we're going to look at a 100-day moving average. Okay, well, that's a rolling 100-day moving average, but it doesn't include the entire chart. It doesn't include every single candle. But what this script does here is at every single candle, like so for example, um, let's just look at this one right here. This would be April 17th. At this moment for this candle, the blue line calculates the standard deviation and then also the moving average. That's what the white line is down there. Um, for all of the candles which came for, uh, before it, and it does that for every single new candle that it gets. So it's kind of like the the cumulative lifetime continuously calculated uh, moving average standard deviation. So if we're looking at that, and then let's also take a look at the moving averages. So um, these are basically a whole bunch of different moving averages, and it's actually kind of a cool chart. Uh, let's let's expand this chart. So one thing that you can see is that uh, right? this is a bunch of moving averages just all overlaid on top of each other. And it creates this kind of like wavy magic kind of thing. Um, it's one of the things that I want to show you guys more uh, in, in the future. Um, so for now, we'll just look at the at the uh, moving averages here. And you can see that the these, this kind of cluster of moving averages has held good support for price um, pretty much for the entire bear market uh, starting in May. Kind of dipped down below it a little bit. Um, you almost maybe would have tried, expected trying to get to the... Uh, Again, sort of this lifetime moving average. Anyway, so what we're looking at here is price is basically kind of being constrained and volatility is dropping off. Um, oops. Uh, between those bands, let me, there we go. Uh, between sort of this upper, like the highest moving average cluster that we have and then and then this lowest moving average cluster. So if we continue going up, and it's it's possible that we will, it's possible that we might end up somewhere here in like the 191 range. That would be kind of a, a reasonable target to shoot for. Uh, at the same time, back here, if you look back in uh, like January, we didn't quite get to this this area that makes that to me would made a lot of sense for us to actually touch this, this upper standard deviation. So um, we'll just have to see with that. Uh, one second. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so let's go to um, let's go to the Monero ratio because uh, that's also been looking pretty nice. So we kind of like crashed a little bit down below this line here, and then we've, we've recovered. Still basically in this channel. Overall, we're kind of just in this channel, which looks suspiciously to me like that that could be um, uh, kind of a bottoming pattern, right? There's like this downward sloping channel after we've come down a significant amount. This, this somewhat rhymes with um, 
let's go way back here to like 2020. This somewhat rhymes with what happened uh, back here in at the end of the last bear market where Monero, it, it, we kind of had more of a, a wedge pattern here. Um, you could draw this a few different ways, I guess. But ultimately, there was kind of like this downward channel happening in 2019. So we might be able to say that this this pattern happening now over here is is somewhat similar. Um, cause we've actually, you know, the bear market, we've actually been going up versus Bitcoin. This low here was made at the top of the, the bull market. So, um, right here, you know, where you could say this looks kind of similar, kind of rhymes, you know, I don't want to go take it too far or anything. That's not to say that, um, you know, that we're out of the woods yet. Like you we could easily come back down here to, to this area. But, um, I, I do think that there's a good chance that the ratio is bottoming here. And that would also be somewhat congruent and corroborating with the notion that, um, this this sort of mid cycle run might be coming towards its end. Um, really was happy and stoked to see things pump, um, even if it was just kind of you know on some silly news about uh, uh, about how the institutions and the governments are going to select our coin to to go up more and pump in value, whatever. But you know it's always nice to have some gains. So um, so that's nice. Um, like I said, the long term stack is still in play. Um, I, I will probably be looking for opportunities to exit that stack. Um, but I, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be too finger on the trigger at the moment yet. I, 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 again, I would like to see things develop in a way that's like long-term easy, you know, the, the signals get mixed and then they start signaling down, even though price is still going up and this trends for a few weeks, it's, it's kind of like in December and January when, uh, when we like slowly over the course of, uh, say two to four weeks, we said, Hey, um, things are clear now, like things are, are turning. And even though the sentiment was terribly bearish, we were getting back in the market um, because it just like it was clear to us to do that. I would love if the end of this run had something similar to that. It doesn't always happen like that. But um, anyways, you know, fingers crossed for uh, for me being able to make a good exit on our long term stack and um, hopefully write out what I think is going to be like sort of the last big washout before we um enter into the sort of the very long-term bullish phase, which, you know, maybe would start like next year. So, um, oh, you know what? One more thing. Monero Tony asked me if I could go over some gold stuff today. So I'm sorry. I, I almost totally missed that. Uh, gold, where are you? I know I put you somewhere. Uh, here we go. But buddy, okay. uh, maybe, maybe I missed what, you, what were you saying though, with regards to, um, exiting your, your, your long, your long-term stack. What were you saying? I, I kind of missed that point. You're looking at. Uh, okay, so um, I sort of like in my mind, I divide things into three separate areas. I've got the hodl, I've got the long-term trading stack, and the short-term trading stack. The short-term is for like um, finding opportunities that like present themselves randomly, and just be like, all right, let's let's take some chances, get in the short-term stack. Um, in January, it was like everything long, right? Um, somewhere, somewhere in like the early weeks of January, it was like get everything long and then just stay long. Um, lately, you know, with the way markets have been, I, I wasn't too confident personally. I had some friends that were very confident that said, no, this thing's going to pump here soon. Um, so I kept my long-term stack in play, but I, I pulled my short-term stack and kind of my, uh, my, sh my shit coin positions off the table. Um, so what, I, what I'm saying in terms of the long-term stack is that at the moment, things look like they could potentially continue going up, but we're also, I'm seeing the signs of this, of, uh, of the potential for this mid cycle run to end. And so what I would like to see personally is just like we saw at the end of December and early in January, where all of the macro signals started to get confused. Like first everything was negative and everything was down like November. Um, and then the signals, like all the macro signals, all our corroborating cross check kind of stuff started to get confused. And so to me, that was a sign that things were actually turning around. So even though there was sort of like massive bearish sentiment, um, we were getting back in the markets in December and early January because the signals went from confused to positive, even though everyone was still bearish and even though price was still pretty low. So that was like an easy, like that was, how can I put this? That was, there was a very long-term um, change of trend, a very large macro change of trend with a lot of corroborating evidence, even though price was still quite low. That was a really easy moment to get back into the markets and to make really solid play. Now, I would love if that happened again here. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, the ideal would just to be going up forever, but then we'll have inflation. So did you really go up if everyone has, you know, a lot more money too? And right. So um, I, I do expect that this year is going to see some kind of big washout before that happens or as the top is sort of um, incipient. I would really love to see the same kind of thing in reverse that we saw from December and January. I want to see all of these macro signals um, turn around, get confused, and then start becoming negative, even as sentiment is 
positive and bullish. And even as markets are basically close to their to their peaks, um, that's just like such an easy decision to make uh, in a trading sense. And uh, you can basically pull my I'm, I'm going to be looking for opportunities, opportunities to pull my long term stack. Um, but my finger's not on the trigger right now. Um, I mean, obviously things can turn around at any moment and it doesn't have to play out like that, right? Like it was great in December when things did play out like that. Um, but things don't always have to play out like that. So, uh, anyways, that's kind of, that was my, my rant there on, on the long term stack. Got so, Makes sense. uh, and now you said you, uh, you have to look at gold. Yeah. Uh, Monero Tony had asked me to, to look at this. I know I'm kind of running a little bit long here. Uh, so we'll try and try and make this quick. So we have gold here against a bunch of different assets. So we've got gold, we've got gold versus the dollar index, gold versus silver and gold versus, um, the S and P. So <clears throat> we can just quickly take a look at the very long term. This is the weekly on gold. Uh, maybe we could take a look at the monthly on gold. I don't like how this chart is kind of dirty, you know, whatever. Um, we can do this, these uh, descriptive statistics as well. Actually, we'll mute them for just a moment. Uh, right now, there's kind of like this rising triangle that's been forming for like, I don't know, basically the entire um, the entire monetary modern monetary history, like 1979. So, um yeah, this chart is a little bit dirty in terms of how you draw these lines here on the bottom. We're kind of at a point that, eh, I mean, things don't, the, the gold price doesn't look too great, especially in light of how the Dixie is, um, you know, the Dixie is looking like it wants to kind of make a run to the upside. Uh, maybe not immediately, but that does give me some current, uh, some concerns for the gold price. So um, that doesn't necessarily have to play out immediately, but I mean, uh, we, we have kind of like lost some of these. We're, we're very close to losing like a very key resistance level. Um, this spot right here uh, is pretty key. And obviously, you know, kind of where the closes were for the weekly here. Um, you've got these uh, shooting stars that happened. And I think we talked about those, uh, this particular shooting star um, back in uh, back in May. So I, I couldn't say that this chart looks uh, super bullish at the moment, but uh, again, gold is one of these assets. It's kind of like Monero. It just sometimes it'll pump in, in when, when, right when we didn't expect it, um, which is kind of, again, why I don't really trade gold. I just sort of use it. I hodl it uh, as a means of, um, of storing value. So um, that's, that's just gold versus US dollar. Another thing we can do is look at gold versus the dollar index um, because it kind of gives us the idea of how gold is performing relative to the Dixie. Because again, as the Dixie goes up, gold tends to have negative price pressure. So um, in my mind, the, the very simple, like this is a very large monthly chart. So we're looking at a decade long chart here. But um, the large structure here is this sort of uh, sideways triangle. And ultimately, since gold price is going to be pegged to the printing of, you know, the infinite printing of money, um, really the exponential printing of money. When you say infinite printing, it's like, oh, my God, we're going to hyperinflate tomorrow. Um, so anyways, the exponential printing of money. Ultimately, this chart's going to break to the upside. It kind of has to just like mathematically, if they're going to print more money and not have the system die, like gold eventually has to break to the upside and, and go here. But, you know, we could be looking at 2026 before that happens, 20, maybe 2025. Um, this is a long-term chart. So right now, uh, gold kind of peaked out at, at the spot you would expect it to. Um, so we'll just have to see. I mean, it, it could hypothetically fall relative to the Dixie even. So which would imply that the Dixie is going up potentially and then gold is going down, but it's going down even more than you would think. Um, so again, I, I'm not like, I don't have necessarily any big opinions on where the gold chart is in the short term. Um, you know, this kind of looks, you can kind of see the curve here happening like that. Uh, I, I don't know. Like that's, I, I don't have any good um, TA on that for you. Um, oh, we could maybe look at, like I said, the, again, the continuously calculated descriptive statistics. Um, basically there's really, there's not much here. And this is, again, this is a, a result of what happens when you have exponential money printing in an asset, which just kind of like goes up always forever. Um, these, these standard deviations and whatnot, the, the moving averages, you almost never touch those. And the same thing happens in the stock market. One thing that was crazy is that the purple line here actually like nailed the, the peak in 2011. Um, that's the, the concept behind the purple line is standard deviation. It's, but it's like a derivative of that, that helps you to get, um, higher up. Okay. So gold and silver, we can look at the gold and silver ratio and we got kind of a similar thing here. It's on a shorter time frame, So this is from 2020, the peak when we, you know, when, when silver like crashed to like, on like ridiculously low, unreasonable prices that you couldn't actually buy physical silver for, um, just the paper silver anyway. So, um, we've got this again, sideways triangle and gold and silver looks kind of like it's, um, you know, it's sort of making this, uh, constraining volatility, which is acts kind of like a spring, right? You're compressing the spring and eventually the spring is going to blow to one side or the other. 
Um, my guess is that this is going to blow towards the upside. In terms of the way that things could play out, like macro stuff, if we get any kind of major crashes back to the lows of like September, October, this thing might actually crash down here for a second and then do one of these. Like that would totally make sense. But on the long term basis, like in terms of 2024, 2025, I very much expect that this thing will go towards the upside. So, um, <laughs> sorry about that. I got a cat in here. Uh, anyway, so this thing could totally, um, is totally going to probably blow to the upside at some point here. But, uh, but we just don't know. Um, I mean, likely it's, that's what it's going to do. Uh, so that's basically what gold looks like for the meantime. Uh, I guess we've got, we could look at the S&P 500 as well. Um, also kind of looks potentially like this kind of sideways triangle here. Um, but sorry, Monero, Tony, I, I wish I had like more clarity on the gold chart here for you. Maybe I can come up with something if I, I'll try and scrutinize it a little bit more this week and see if I can come up with any theories here. Um, but yeah, that's that's the price report. Uh, so, any any questions, guys? Glad to see that uh, that uh, XMRBTC ratio uh, coming back up nicely. Yeah, it yeah, dipped 100%. there pretty hard. Yeah, funny how it, it dipped. Was that like right before they announced the uh, the delisting, or right after? I think it was right before. Yeah, I mean, I I do tend to think that they that those those are. I mean, I don't know exactly what their mechanisms are now at this point. I assume that they've acquired a stack of Monero that they didn't have because simply because they haven't been shutting down withdrawals like they have previously. So I assume that they've got kind of a, a reasonable enough stack of Monero to kind of, um, you know, play some games with it. So hmm. It also could just be because Bitcoin was, you know, punching, you know, doing crazy stuff, going, you know, hitting big, big uh, gains. Good stuff, man. As always, you got you got a lot of fans, a lot of people uh, praising your price report. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks guys. <laughs> awesome job as usual. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, thanks, man. Uh, we'll keep it moving. All right. Talk All to right. you guys later. Appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Yep.